Today on the podcast, we head to Michigan to talk with herbalist Bevan Cohen. We'll talk all about herbs, using herbs, growing herbs, find out about culinary, cosmetic, medicinal uses. One of the neat things that I picked up was the difference between an infusion and a decoction. Now in the fig segment, we head to Philadelphia where we chat with YouTuber and millennial fig pig Ross Raddy. For Emma's tomato segment, we talk about some of her top varieties. The Food Garden Life podcast today is a rebroadcast of the radio show that aired live on the 7th of April. Welcome to the Food Garden Life Show with your hosts, Emma and Stephen Biggs, right here on Reality Radio 101. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show with your hosts, Emma and Stephen Biggs. We talk to creative food gardeners and food garden experts who break the rules and make new ones. Emma Biggs is a popular speaker, and she's only 15. Emma is the author of Gardening with Emma. Stephen Biggs is the author of the Canadian bestseller, No Guff Vegetable Gardening, the award-winning Grow Figs Where You Think You Can't, Grow Lemons Where You Think You Can't, and Growing Figs in Cold Climates, 150 of your questions answered. Now, here are your hosts, the daughter and father duo, Emma Biggs and Stephen Biggs. Hi everyone, I'm Emma Biggs and thanks for hanging out with us today on the Food Garden Life Show. I'm a 15 year old Gen Z gardener, author, speaker and blogger and my passion is growing tomatoes, trying new, unusual crops and saving seed. Hey everyone, I'm Stephen Biggs, food gardening guy, horticulturist, author and horticultural journalist. We think that growing and cooking together grounds people, strengthens families and builds communities. Our goal is to inspire and inform with stories and ideas about gardening, food, and people. We give gardeners permission and confidence to challenge the rules. We can all make a difference in the world and what we eat and what we grow is one way that we can do that. Have you grown herbs some years and then only to realize at the end of the year that you didn't get around to doing much with them? Well, That's me sometimes. I have good intentions of making herbal teas or cooking with whatever new herb I'm trying. And as I was getting ready for our guest today, I thought back to when I grew epizote for the first time a couple of years back. I kept looking at it, kept thinking about it, thinking I ought to do something with it, only to put it off for another day. And I never did get around to experimenting with it. And so if you've ever looked at the herbs in your garden and you weren't sure what to do with them, our guest today has lots of great ideas for us. Bevan Cohen is a herbalist, author, seed saver, and all-around inspiring gardener. He joined us on the show of April last year when we talked about saving seeds and the stories behind them. He's on the line today from Michigan where he farms with his family. Bevan's brand new book, The Artisan Herbalist, Making Teas, Tinctures, and Oils at Home. He's also the author of Saving Our Seeds and From Our Seeds and Their Keepers. Find them online at smallhousefarm.com. And today in Emma's tomato segment, she'll talk about varieties she's excited about growing this year. And we also can't forget the fig segment. Today, Dad chats with the YouTuber and millennial fig pig, Ross Raddy, and how he's moved up his fig harvest by a whole month. Yes, a whole month. Get on board now. Questions, comments, or just want to give us a shout out. The studio email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. Now, before we get to our guest, how are you doing? I've just closed up my online seed, seed shop for the season, I, and I have a few hundred different tomato seedlings underway in the basement. Understatement, Emma. 
Okay, maybe more than that. I have a lot, <laughs> and I am so excited for all the tomatoes to come. And later this month, I will also be giving an online kids' gardening class at the Toronto Botanical Garden. So if you're into tomatoes or you have kids and want to get them out ex excited about the garden and outside, make sure you look at the torontobotanicalgarden.ca. This spring marks a 15-year anniversary for me. In spring 2006, I impulsively quit an office job to stay home and look after two toddlers. And I can still picture the look of surprise on my wife Shelley's face the day I came home and casually mentioned, oh, by the way, I quit my job today. The, the gig at the time was recruiting, and I was great on the phone and hopeless at recruiting because I think my heart was in the soil. So I refocused on family and, and began my life of coaxing a double stroller into the trunk of a Chevy Cavalier, taking care of Emma and my nephew. And that's also when I got into teaching horticulture and through my writing and blogs and books and speaking newsletters and teaching in-person classes. So to celebrate that 15 year anniversary, I've pulled together edible gardening inspiration from my teaching and presentations and people I've interviewed and I'm making a brand new online course. It's called Edible Garden Makeover, and it's all about making an edible garden you love. I'd be honored if you want to know more about it. You can be the first to find out when I put out more details. Just get on my early bird list, and you'll find that if you go to ediblegardenmakeover.com slash early hyphen bird. So that's ediblegardenmakeover.com slash early hyphen bird definitely go and check that out now we'd love if you kept in touch with us between radio shows and we want to hear what you think too you can mes message us on foodgardenlife.com and also find us on facebook twitter and instagram where we hang out under the handle food garden life and i also hang out on instagram under the handle emma biggs underscore grows and my website is emma biggs.ca and while you're at foodgardenlife.com make sure that you also sign up for dad's newsletter and with it you get two free guides 20 small space food gardening hacks and grow figs where you think you can't in cold climates and don't forget to tune in to our weekly podcasts by going to foodgardenlife.com or wherever you get your podcast. And some of the fun ones that we've had since our last live radio show, we dropped by Germany to chat with forest, a forest garden designer and rare fruit enthusiast. We headed to Iowa to hear about a grade eight middle school foraging elective that was so popular it had a waiting list. We headed to Montreal to hear how one veg garden installation company is using a corporate garden strategy to build food security. And then in Quebec City, we heard this really inspiring tale of civil disobedience by growing vegetables right in front of the provincial parliament buildings. Yeah, we've had a lot of fun with all of the episodes this past month, so definitely make sure that you tune in. And we, did a, we recorded another really fun one today uh, that we really enjoyed doing, and there's so many more great episodes coming up, so definitely make sure to tune in. Now, some shout outs today to some of our listeners. Thank you for all the messages that you guys send us. We really appreciate it. A thanks to Sam. Um, thanks to Jane, who's in Queens, New York. To Bill, who loved the episode where he talked about making dandelion donuts. Thanks to Kyle, who enjoyed my tomato seedling video on social media. And Kyle also asked about the greenhouse, which I have been continuously <laughs> negotiating getting with Dad. So it's still a work in progress. Thanks for asking. I think... We're almost there at getting one. And also a thanks to Susan in Leamington and also for sending us some cool seats. And also a couple more shout outs to organizations doing things that we love. Please check out Kids Gardening at kidsgardening.org. And these amazing people help families and educators channel the curiosity and wonder of kids towards gardening. We love what they do. And they've cheered us along as we've worked to share inspiration in Emma's book, Gardening with Emma. And if you like the arts, please check out Algoma Trad. A L G O M A T R A D dot C A is their website, algomatrad.ca. And Emma and I went there to rosin up our bows for Cajun and Quebec fiddling at the music camp. And we found so much more a community of different generations who were celebrating mu music, arts, heritage crafts, and gardening. And their plans for a new four-season center include an edible garden. So 
I'm donating a portion of the proceeds from my upcoming Edible Garden Makeover course to these two great groups because I just love the way they foster community and family in a way that weaves in gardening. Yeah, we've had so much fun working with both the people at Algoma Trad and Kids Gardening, so definitely go and check them out. Now back to today's show. Our theme today is herbs, and we are so happy that herbalist, author, seed saver, and all-around amazing guy, Bevan Cohen, is joining us again from Michigan, where he farms with his family. Bevan's brand new book is The Artisan Herbalist, Making Teas, Tinctures, and Oils at Home, and so make sure that you check him out at smallhousefarm.com. And remember, we post contact information in the show notes. That goes up on the website, foodgardenlife.com, the day after the show. If you have questions for Bevan, get on board now, instudio101 at gmail.com. And now, without further ado, let's bring Bevan Cohen on the line. Bevan, welcome to the show. Hello, Emma. Hello, Stephen. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have you back. Thanks for being here. And why don't we start out by just asking you about the the road you took to becoming a herbalist? Well, sure. You know, my road to herbalism began at a very young age. Um, I grew up with my grandmother in an apartment um, on the edge of town, sort of where the city meets the forest. And I spent a lot of my time um, as a young man wandering in the woods and exploring. And, you know, I was just... I was just amazed when I started to realize the diversity of the plants around me, just in my little bit of the woods that I spent time in, so many different plants. And I thought, wow, if, if there's so many plants, so much diversity in this little space, what is it like in the rest of the world? And I, it became a, a lifelong fascination with plants. And as I got a little older, you know, uh, late teens, early 20s, I found some like-minded folks and we began a, an herb study group where we actually sat down together and made a, a point of, of studying the plants in our bioregion and, and the multitude of uses for them, both medicinally as well as their culinary uses. And um, well, I guess, you know what they say, uh, the rest is history. You know, here we are today. Yeah. And so I guess you thought that the world needed, and I think so too, needed all this knowledge about herbalism because you've packaged so much about it all in a great brand new book. So what was your inspiration for putting it all together for anyone to pick up and look at? That's a great question, Emma. You know, I always wanted to put my thoughts, my experiences with the plants that, that I work with into a book. Um, even so much, you know, even years ago, uh, you know, we teach a lot of herbalism classes, you know, wellness classes and stuff through Small House Farm. And years ago, we even put together a small little booklet about some of the herbs that we're working with that we gave away as a promotion for everybody that registered. And it was just so much fun to put that together and share that with people. So New Society, they came to me um, and asked me to make this book for part of their homegrown city life series. And I thought, well, this is like the moment that I've been waiting for. So it, you're right, it is packed full of information. I wanted to share as much of my knowledge and my experience and my philosophy about herbalism as well in this book. So. I'm just so happy with the way that it came out, and I'm just really excited to be able to share share that with the rest of the world now. Okay. Well, one of the things you've shared in the book, in addition to how to how to use herbs, is how to build a herbal business. And uh, I thought that was a really neat addition, and I wonder if we could unpack that a little bit. Sure. You know, I thought that, to me, the way that we look at things in the world isn't isn't always without having to be concerned about money, I suppose, you know, at the end of the day, some of us are looking at things where we want to make herbs more than just a hobby. We want to make it our livelihood. Um, so, you know, at Small House, we've been in business here, our little herbal homestead since 2014. And, you know, there was a lot of hurdles and challenges and mistakes that we made along the way to get to where we're at. So I thought that this book was a great opportunity to share that experience so, so other folks that pick up this book, they can kind of negotiate that a little bit better than I did, learn from my mistakes. You know, so the book does talk about things like developing your brand or packaging and labeling, marketing, laws and regulations, those sorts of things too. But one of the greatest opportunities I think about an herbal business from the perspective of the artisan herbalist is that it's unique to the person and to the locale of where you're at, working with your local herbs that you grow, or that you harvest from your area makes what you offer to the world unique and special, different than what other herbalists may offer. Hmm. And I think that's important. 
I like that. Unique and special. And, and it's a way to weave the herbs into your life in even a bigger way. Absolutely. It is, you know, because the herbs are a part of our life and sometimes we don't even realize it. So when we, we can approach it with that, um, intentional state of mind it really helps us realize that they are weaved throughout our life in lots of ways nice i'll just uh, read out a couple of emails here mike has emailed in just to say hello bigs family loving the show and thanks mike for also tuning into the podcast and mike's just asking about whether it's difficult to grow herbs and spices and i think we'll we'll dig into a little bit more of the growing in a minute and then another email coming in from steve in delson Montreal. And um, thank you for the email. And uh, he's also wondering about Emma's seeds. And I think you just closed off the store now, didn't you? Yeah, well, you know what, I'm almost out of seeds, and I'm done selling them for this year, I'll be selling more in the fall. But Bevan actually sells lots of great seeds on his website. So how about you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's true, Emma. We do. We offer a number of different seeds on our website, you know, smallhousefarm.com. And those are all seeds that we grow um, and tend and harvest and process right here uh, at our little homestead in Michigan. So we've got a great variety of tomatoes and peppers and beans and greens and all sorts of groovy stuff um, that, like I said, my family and I grow right here with love. And um, yeah, absolutely. Check out the website and see what there is that interests you. I, I, uh, our seeds come highly recommended. <laughs> yes, by us yeah. too. Here's a here's a listener question now, Bevan, and it's from Walter, and uh, he's wondering: Are there any natural herbs or tonics that are a natural antibiotic that he could grow? Oh, there's a number of them actually. A, a, a number of herbs are wonderful for that sort of thing. Now, when we're looking for antibiotics for like topical use and that sort of thing, I recommend. Uh, really easy to grow herbs. Actually, you can grow things like echinacea or lavender, uh, very simple to grow and harvest and process. Wonderful for topical antibiotic use, certainly. Okay, excellent. Now we just had another question come in from Justin. We're gonna get to a whole bunch of other things, but this, uh, Justin is asking about beginner, what does a beginner need? Uh, sorry, what is the easiest herb to grow for a beginner who's on a balcony with lots of sun? And I think let's start here. Let's talk a little bit about growing herbs, maybe in general, but then I think we should dig in to all the stuff and the herbal uses in your new book. Yeah. So what's your recommendation for an easy to grow balcony herb in the sun? I love this question because when I lived with my grandmother in a little apartment, like I was just talking about, all of my growing happened on a balcony. That was the uh, extent of my space available to me. Um, so this is a, a situation that I'm familiar with. What you really want to grow, especially if you're a beginning grower, are mint plants. Not necessarily mint itself, but anything from that family, Lamiaceae. They're, they're very simple to grow. Um, they're almost impossible to, to not grow succeed with. Things like mint, peppermint, spearmint, lemon balm. We, we, can, we can go a little bit further though. We could think about things like oregano, um, thyme. These are herbs that are going to thrive in a balcony. They love the sun and being in the mint family, they're very, very useful to an herbalist for a multitude of things and very, very simple to grow. Okay, excellent. Now, something you just said, being useful to a herbalist, I think is a good segue into something I wanted to ask you about, which is the idea that herbs can be used uh, beyond the kitchen, because we're talking also about cosmetics and medicinal uses. So I wonder if you could just expand on that idea a little bit, Bevan. Certainly. So when we teach about herbs, I actually like to start in the kitchen, because that's how folks are the most familiar with working with plants, um, is using them as uh, spices and this sort of thing to accentuate our meals. Um, but we can just take that one step further and move that into herbal teas. So we don't even have to leave the kitchen and we can start making medicinal brews, right? Um, th these, are, these infusions that we can make, but we can keep going with that and we can start making cosmetics, medicines, all medicines that even the modern medicines that we use were all originally derived from plants, right? Plants are incredibly potent and they are useful for our beauty, our health, our wellness, as well as to make our meals even more delicious. Um, everything that we may need in a way kind of herbs provide that. So now okay. I want to also talk about herbal teas, which you just mentioned. I love drinking a nice hot cup of tea in the middle of the winter. And so when people want to start making tea from herbs that they've grown in their garden, how do they go about doing that to start? So I always recommend starting with one herb at a time. 
Um, and I get into this uh, in the book because I think it's important, especially for beginner herbalists, to start simple and to start small. And if we just pick one herb to work with, we can kind of build a relationship with that plant, get familiar with it, uh, its flavor and aroma, its benefits, that sort of thing. So pick an herb that you enjoy or that you have access to. Get yourself a teapot, right? A kettle so you can heat up your water and a reusable tea bag or tea ball of some sort. Or you can even purchase pre-made tea bags filled with herbs um, from the local grocery. You can certainly start there if you need to. It's accessible to everybody that way. And then um, just heat your water up and you steep it, right? Um, start with one herb and get yourself a notebook. That's what I like to say. You know, and to take notes when you start with your tea. What we're crafting here is an herbal infusion where we're using the hot water to extract the chemical components from the plant material. And you'll notice that right away as the water changes color, as you can smell the plant, this is the chemical, these are coming out of the plant and into the water, right? That's the extraction happening there when we make an infusion. Um, so pick something simple. Again, we could go back to those mint family herbs, start with one of those, brew it into a tea, sit down and take some notes about what the flavor, the aroma, all that sort of thing. I wanted to ask you, Bevan, what's your favorite herbal tea? Mm, that's like picking a favorite child. Um, you know, <laughs> that's tough. And it, it changes over time, you know, depending on my mood or the time of year, whatever's in season to harvest, that sort of thing. Right now, the tea that I've been drinking the most of is a blend. Um, I actually start with a black tea base, Camellia sinensis for the base. It's got dried nettle leaves, some echinacea in it, a little bit of sage and some red clover flowers. And uh, it's a nourishing brew. It's very delicious. But it's also good for my immune system. It's full of energy. Um, and that's, that's kind of been my go-to lately. It's uh, nice. a, a tasty brew. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay. that sounds good. Well, I'm wondering for people who want to want to take it a step further and they actually want to make their own blends for making tea, how should they go about doing that? Well, so we start with like what I like to call a base. There's three steps to kind of building a tea. Um, so we'll pick one herb. Um, as the base. This is kind of going to be the, uh, in, in the tea that I just mentioned is I'm actually using a black tea for my base. This is the, the bulk of the herb, right? So if we're making something for flavor, just to drink as an enjoyable beverage, we want to keep that in mind. Or if we're making a medicinal tea, that's how we're going to choose this herb. Then we want to accentuate that with some flavor, right? So we'll pick eh, generally some sort of floral, uh, whether it's chamomile or red clovers or calendula, again, depending on where we're going with our brew, um, to add on to that. Right. And then we add a little bit of backbone to it, something to give it that extra punch that it needs. I love to add nettles to my teas. Nettles kind of has a green flavor. So that's why it's important to have something floral in there to make it a little more palatable. But it is one of the most nutritious things that you can consume is nettle leaves. So I like to add those to all of my teas. OK, I have to ask, what's the weirdest herbal tea that you've ever come across? You know, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know if necessarily weird, but I like to make tea from garlic. I like to add garlic to my tea. And a lot of oh. people find that to be unusual. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a very warming tea, a little bit spicy, certainly. Uh, but garlic is high in zinc. And zinc is really going to help um, cold and flu season, right? That's, that's an important medicinal that we need. So I like to put garlic right into my tea. Um, so maybe a little weird, but definitely awesome. Okay. Wow, that's unusual. I've never heard of that, but I love garlic. So who knows? Maybe I'll have to give that a try. Yeah, we'll sneak some into mom's cup of tea <laughs> and see what she says. Uh, Bevan, we had uh, both uh, Florence and Beth have uh, emailed in wondering where they can get the book. Where can they look for the book? Sure. I mean, they can buy the book um, from my website here in, if they're in the United States at smallhousefarm.com. Um, if they're up there in Canada, they can buy it directly from the publisher at newsociety.ca. Um, it's also available pretty much anywhere books are sold. So Amazon, bookshop, local bookstores, they could get it there. Um, wherever they like to buy books, they can go there and request it if it's not on the shelf, and I'm sure they'll get it in for them. Great. Now, Larry just emailed in and is asking whether there are any herbs or spices that they shouldn't grow because it may be a hazard to the cats that they have. Oh, well, you know, a lot of the herbs that we're going to deal with medicinally, especially as a beginning herbalist, aren't going to be too dangerous for our local pets. I think it's really important that when we work with herbs, especially when we're new to herbalism, that we work with uh, generally regarded as safe plants, grass, right? Um, that way, not only is it safe for us, but it's safe for our pets and that sort of thing. So if we stick with the herbs that are 
all listed in the artisan herb list. It's 38 of my favorite herbs to work with. Um, they can guarantee you that it's safe for themselves, for their friends and family, as well as for all of you guys. Great. Now we had another question coming from Mason. First of all, he asked how my seeds are going so far. I'm not selling seeds now, but Bevan is, and he has some pretty awesome stuff. So make sure you again check out his website if you're interested in seeds. And then second is asking, uh, how did Bevan come up with the name Small House for his business? And he's wondering whether you live in a small house. Well, I do live in a relatively small house, um, but it's not a tiny house. You know, it's it's uh, plenty large enough for my family. It's like 1,100 square feet. Um, but it is a small house and more so than, than describing my home. I think that small house represents my philosophy, you know, um, here at small house, we believe in, in small, local, simple, and slow. And I think that the, the, the name small house really represents what we're trying to do for the world. Nice. And I think one thing that's important as gardeners is just to make sure that you have a house that's big enough for fermenting tomato seeds, drying bean seeds, and all those gardening books you have. Goodness, Emma. Boy, you know, when we bought Small House, there was two bathrooms in the building, and now there is only one, and the other one has turned into storage for all of those things you just listed. So, yes. <laughs> nice. Dad, I well, may take over a bathroom soon. <laughs> talking about competing interests, Bob just emailed in, and he says, Stephen, with all of these herbs that Emma will be growing now, she needs that greenhouse. What are you waiting for? Uh, thank you, Bob. And uh, Bob also is enjoying the show today. So thank you for the shout out. So Bevan, we'll let you in on this. Um, I've been trying to convince dad to get us a greenhouse because I think that we need one. And so when people are mentioning the greenhouse, that's because this is an ongoing thing and I'm still trying to convince him to get one. You know, and I'm not sure why it's so hard to convince him. You know, Stephen, having a greenhouse, we just have a couple of small hoop houses here um, and they are so valuable and useful. Um, they, they come highly recommended. I know they take up some space and sometimes we're working with limited space, but what you're able to accomplish, extending your season, getting the plants out of the house a little earlier, so many benefits. I'm totally on Emma's side with this one. Oh. Well, <laughs> well, Emma's thanks. just grinning like the cat that ate the canary. So, so let's change the topic. I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, what's the difference when we're talking about teas between an infusion and a decoction because I, I saw the lingo in the book and I thought I bet a lot of people wonder about the difference. Sure and really um, they're very similar but the difference really now in an infusion is when we're working with uh, leaves, flowers, um, thinly coated seeds, that sort of thing. Things that are really easy to break down the cell wall on the plant to extract the chemical components whereas with the decoction is when we're working with harder thick roots, um, shells with you know seeds with thick shells on them stuff that are a little more tough um, and we need to, to boil that is what we're doing instead of with an infusion where we just pour the hot water over the herbs like we do when we brew a tea in this case we're putting the herbs into a pot of water and boiling it over an extended period of time to really break that plant material down um, so all the volatile chemicals can be extracted um, so that's that's very similar but a little bit of a difference is mostly just the uh the amount of time they're exposed to the hot water. Okay. Now, when I think of herbs, I generally, what comes to mind first is the leaves and the flowers. So when you're doing this, what, what are some examples of things that you might um, use decoction for? So the recently we've been doing dandelion root um, okay. is the thing that we've been decocting. This is the greatest time for me in the year to start to harvest our dandelion roots. Um, you know, the, the plants are still relatively dormant. So a lot of that energy is still down in the root system and they're, they're, we're finally able to find them. It's, you know, that time of year. So we've been digging them up. Some dandelion roots will go to be tinctured certainly, uh, but I like to make some decoctions with some as well. It's very, very good for a sluggish digestive system um, to stimulate the bile in your liver, um, to kind of revitalize yourself after a long, um, cold winter. So that's what we've been recently decocting is, is dandelion roots. Yeah, and after Easter, too, I think we all might need that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, another uh, um, piece of lingo that would be fun to dig into is the idea of a tincture. And, and how does one make a tincture and what is it? Sure. So a tincture is really just an alcohol extraction. Like with the tea, with the water infusion, we're using water to extract the chemicals from the plant material. With the tincture, we're going to use alcohol as the solvent. It's also called a menstruum in herbalism. This is the, the material that we're going to use to extract from the plant. So a tincture is made by using alcohol as your menstruum to make an extraction. 
Okay. And then what does one after the tincture is made then add it to, uh, say, if you're making a tea out of it? Is that how you might use it? Well, you can. So now a tincture, some of the most popular tinctures that you're going to find that you may not even realize are tinctures are things like vanilla extract or almond extract, right? Oh. Um, that they use in the kitchen. That's essentially, it's a tincture. These, these are vanilla beans or bitter almonds that are extracted in alcohol. You can also find them uh, as bitters, they call it, that they use to flavor cocktails, right? Those are just essentially botanicals infused in alcohol. Right. So that, those are tinctures right there. So you can use them in the kitchen like that. Um, but from the medicinal side of herbalism, we often use them in small doses by the drop. We may add them to tea or water to dilute them to make them more palatable, or you can drip them under your tongue. It's important to understand that while some chemical components of plants are water soluble, a, a, a portion of them are water soluble, almost all of them are alcohol soluble. So tinctures are very potent medicinals. So the doses are much smaller. Whereas with the tea, you might drink six to eight ounces of tea multiple times a day. Tinctures are measured by the drop. A quarter teaspoon is a very large dose. Um, they're very potent medicinal extractions. So uh, a question for you, and maybe it's a silly one, but I just uh, heard a presentation on making gin and they talked about the botanicals going in there and the flavor coming out in the alcohol. So can we call gin a tincture or is that stretching the limits a bit? Well, that would be right along the border, I think, but certainly the, the, the theory is the same. By adding those botanicals to the distillation process, um, they, the, those chemicals that are extracted from those botanicals end up in the final product, which is what gives it that flavor. So in a way that is very much like a tincture. Okay. And now moving on to another one, let's talk about infused oil. Right. Now with an infused oil, we're using fat is our menstrual fat to extract chemicals from plant material. And, and quite a number of them are fat soluble chemicals. So like you would do in the kitchen, you know, you can add some herbs or some cayenne peppers to some olive oil. It lends that flavor to the oil. You can make a salad dressing or whatever you might do with it. Um, that's the, essentially the philosophy now of an infused oil. When you can sense that flavor in the oil, you know that those chemicals are being extracted from the plant. Right. So on the medicinal side of things, we make it just like that, but a lot more plant material. The ratio of plant to oil is significantly more, which makes a much more potent infused oil. Wow. So this is really interesting. I'd never thought of it this way before, but we're looking at our herbs and we can think, is it water soluble, alcohol soluble or fat soluble? Right. And so it's an interesting thing when you want to understand maybe how to harness the flavor when you're in the kitchen or to harness the medicinal benefits of the plant when you're in the apothecary. Um, some plants react to certain treatments a little bit better. So in the Artisan Herbalist, throughout the book, with each herb profile that we talk about, I break that down so you can understand, depending on what you want to use the plant for, what's the best method to go about crafting your product. Okay. Now, Carl just emailed in asking, what did you do before you became a farmer? He said, I wish I had the guts. What a beautiful career. Uh, well, I did all sorts of interesting things with my life, I suppose. Um, I used to organize a music festival and stuff in my youth, um, but I don't suppose you could call that a job, and I don't think I really made any money doing that. Um, mm. But for a long time, I actually, I did marketing for State Farm Insurance, which, what a 180 from what I do with my life now. Um, so very similar, Stephen, to the story that you were telling earlier. Um, there was a day that I realized that perhaps I was on the wrong path, and um, I had to make a serious change. And it's one of those leaps of faith where I just said, you know, enough is enough. We're going to go do something different now. And this is where I ended up. Wow. A big step. And uh, looking back, it, it seems so right, I'm sure. It does now, but there's definitely been some times where I questioned my decision making. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think what's important in life is to enjoy what you're doing. Um, and, and I do enjoy what I'm doing every day. Sometimes I find myself out in the woods and I look up and I realize that this is essentially my day at work, right? Is out in the woods or out in the garden. You know, even if I'm, if I have to weed that day, which is kind of a pain, it's still a lot better than sitting behind a desk was for me. Everybody enjoys different things in this world. So you just got to find what fits and what feels right. And you just got to go for it. And we're only here for a limited time, right? So we got to make the most of what we got. Yeah. So, so very true. And that's how I feel when I'm on the radio. So uh, it's funny how we can find our, our place in the world. I wanted to ask you next about some more lingo. 
And as we as we think about using herbs in cosmetics, we hear the terms lotion and balm and salve. What what are those? And that is a, a place where people seem to there's some common misconceptions about what those words mean, and they're very very similar. Now these are all made uh, with infused oils and the addition of beeswax is what we use, um, a solidifying agent. So you melt the beeswax into the oil, blend it together, and then as the beeswax cools, as the formula cools, the beeswax will harden back up to give you your final product. The greatest difference between a salve, a balm, and a lotion is the ratio of oil to wax. The more wax that you have in your formula, the stiffer your product's gonna be on the salve side. The less wax, more oil, the softer your product's gonna be on the lotion side. So in the Artisan Herbalist, we break that formula down um, to give people starting spots, depending on what they want to make ratios to begin with. But I always encourage folks to experiment what's going to work best for them. Start here and use this kind of as a leaping off point to, to discover what's going to work best for you. Okay. Well, in the book, you talk about lots of really neat herbs and things you can forage or grow, or even just things from the spice cabinet. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is basil and you said in the book and you talk about this a bit too that it has some really interesting fables and folklore so could you tell us a bit about that yeah you know basil basilica is an interesting plant for sure and one of the things that i always found was interesting about the folklore folklore in any way when you read old herbals are just filled with these stories that are i mean they're amazing you know and it's it's amazing to think that at the time it may have been commonplace thinking wildly accepted that the the scent of basil that smelling basil could cause scorpions to grow in the brain right um that was just accepted by people that way of thinking um and so i tried to touch on that with all of the herbs a little bit of that that cultural history um because i think it's important as we delve into the world of herbalism and we begin to work with these plants that we understand their histories and their cultures and their stories because it, it's in a way identifies who these plants are and who these plants have been to people for so long. So for me as an herbalist, as I develop my relationship with the plant, I want to know what everyone else has done with the plant as well. So I can, I can learn that plant's personality in a way. And that helps me work with it in what I find to be a more efficient manner. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all those stories in the book too and fables and folklore, because I think it really does help people get to know the different herbs a lot better. Now, one other one that I want to touch on is I found out from your book that you can eat calendula leaves, and I had no idea. So could you tell us a bit about that? You know, for me, um, I've used calendula topically for, I would I could say decades. I don't want to age myself, I guess, how long I've been practicing herbalism, but we can say that I can use the word decades and not be stretching the truth. Um, and for most of that time, I was using calendula topically. It's It's wonderful. Uh, for your skin, it's an emollient herb. You, you know, you can make lotions and lip balms and all sorts of wonderful things with it. Um, very healing, nourishing herb. Um, and it's probably only been within the last seven or eight years where I tried to use calendula in the kitchen. And I was out of state at an event, at a gardening thing, and we were on kind of a garden tour. And the person leading the tour literally picked a calendula flower and ate it. And I thought, oh, that's unusual, right? Um, but I tried it too, because that's the way that I am. And they're delicious. Um, I love to add them to salads. Now it like changed everything. And when I teach, you see, no matter what I'm teaching, herbalism, seed saving, gardening, I always try to convince people to look at their plants a little bit differently than what we're used to, you know, um, especially our food plants. There's so many things out there that we don't realize are delicious edibles that we've been growing this whole time. And calendula is a great example of that. So grow some, try it, harvest the petals, put them into your salads, put them in your teas. You're going to love it. Hmm. Okay. Now an email just came in from James, who's uh, saying hi from Buffalo, New York. And he's wondering if you ever get to upstate New York after COVID to give any talks or seminars. I don't have anything currently on the schedule, but I would absolutely love to. Um, Pre-COVID, we were actually heading through upstate New York on the way to uh, Vermont for the International Herb Association conference that I was going to speak at. So that may get rescheduled or it may not, we'll see. Um, but follow me online, join, join up with me on the website or Instagram or whatever and stay in touch. And then if I do come through your area, let's figure something out because I would love to uh, 
visit your community and talk about gardening and herbalism with you. Great. Well, Bevan, we're almost out of time, but before we finish up, I want to ask about some top tips for people who are hearing about all this really cool um, stuff to do with herbalism and they want to get started. What are some of your top tips? Start slow, take your time, you know, um, no point in rushing into things, pick a few plants and work with those. You know, when we talked about earlier about easy plants to grow, we talked about plants from the mint family. So if you're going to try cultivating plants, start there. Uh, but I mean, Mother Nature's already doing so much of the work. We could certainly try foraging things. Everybody's yard's got dandelions, and plantains, and, and prunella, and all sorts of things that you know some folks consider weeds, but they're all useful, beneficial herbs. So just pick a few plants that are already around you, get out your notebook, start slow, and have fun. Okay. And uh, we have an email that just came in from Katie and she's heard that you made a film and wondering if that's the case and where can they find it? Nope. I have not made a film yet. We've actually got a project in the works, um, but we don't have anything solid yet. Um, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure what she's she's asking about. So okay. Ben does not have a film, but he has some pretty awesome books that you should He's definitely got some check amazing out. Books. And I should mention too, Katie just put in a little nudge about the, the greenhouse for Emma. So thanks for that. And Rita was asking if you ship your seeds to Canada. Well, we may have um, a slightly more expensive shipping when we ship things to Canada, but we certainly can get it done for you. Wonderful. Well, Bevan, it's been a, so much fun talking to you, to you today. We've learned, I know I've learned so much and I'm so excited for the coming growing season so I can put everything I've just picked up to you. So thanks for joining us on the show today. Emma, Stephen, thank you so much for having me. I had a great time as usual and I hope that we get to do it again someday. I'm looking forward to it. And thanks for all the tips on herbs. It, it's helped me put together a few different concepts in my mind. That's wonderful news. That's what it's all about, man. Great. Okay. Thanks, Bevan. Bye now. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful day. You too. Great. So that was Bevan Cohen, and he's a herbalist, author, seed saver, and all-around inspiring guy. Bevan Cohen is from Michigan, and he also has a farm, and you can find out all about everything he does, his fantastic books, his seeds, uh, lots of different things on the website, smallhousefarm.com. Okay. And we are moving into the Bigs on Figs segment, and this is the part of the show where we talk about figs and today we head to philadelphia to chat with youtuber and millennial fig grower ross ratty who has joined us before on the show to talk about his work growing figs and about his backyard full of edibles i'm pretty excited about what he's up to he's using low tunnels which are just low to the ground hoops covered with plastic to create temporary mini greenhouses. You can find them online if you go to figboss.com and on YouTube and Instagram as Ross Raddy, R-A-D-D-I. So now here is my chat with Ross Raddy. Hey, Ross, thanks for hanging out for the Bigs on Fig segment today. It's great to have you back. Yeah, thanks again, Steve, for having me. I always enjoy coming on the radio show. So some of your um, your videos that you've been putting up, Ross, have me pretty excited because it is a lot of work overwintering fig trees, and you've got some really neat stuff going on between your cut and cover method and then using low tunnels in the spring to jumpstart your figs. Can you kind of walk us through what you're doing? Yeah, I would love to because I'm very, very excited about this whole method just a very exciting thing that I think a lot of people can do and it would really extend the growing range of figs further than what most people would think. This makes it very easy and very efficient. Um, it can make it so that I believe somebody at the very minimum down to a zone five could be growing figs quite successfully. The first part of this whole puzzle it's really getting the fig tree through the wintertime. Like you said, I, the method I like to use is called the cut and cover method. But really anything that can get your fig tree through the wintertime is going to be successful for what our purposes are, which is to inevitably grow figs underneath a low tunnel. And we'll get into the reasons why that's so important and, and how that's even possible. But uh, anything you can do to get it through the wintertime. So what I do is, because I have them spaced very, very closely. I've spaced my 
my fig trees, I've experimented with a foot, two feet, three foot, and this is on center. So hmm. I've really spaced them very densely to see well, what is the best spacing? What can I get away with? And uh, one method to really mass protect, because if you had, let's say, in a, in a 124, uh, 120 square foot area, if you had uh, 20 trees in that area, you know, that's a lot of work in the wintertime, either to dig it up and put it in a pot maybe and, and keep it somewhere warm or even just to wrap each individual tree. If you're talking 20, 40, 60, I mean, I have over 100 trees now planted on my property. If I were to individually wrap them, it's just so much work. Yeah. So one, one method that actually a, a friend of mine in Connecticut, shout out to Mario, and uh, what he would do is he would cut them back quite far, maybe to even six to 12 inches high off the ground. And then he would throw even just house installation over top. And he's, he was a builder by trade for many years. And so he knows that he has all these interesting materials and he used to actually work with concrete a lot. And one of the materials he likes to use is a concrete blanket. Hmm. And those are, for anyone that knows, curing concrete, you got to keep it a bit warm. And that's a really great material, although very expensive. But if you had access to something like that, you could very easily throw a concrete blanket over top of your fig tree, even if you were to bend the branches down and, and not even cut it. Let's just bend the branches and stake them down to the ground and throw a, throw a concrete blanket over it. You're going to have great success getting it through the wintertime. And the reason for that is because the ground is warm. And if you can insulate the ground, the ground is a heat source, right? The earth is a heat source. So if we can insulate that, we're able to keep the fig tree a lot warmer throughout the winter. So I would argue if you had the right materials, you did this the right way. I don't see why, and like I said, in a zone five climate, maybe even lower, that you could get your fig trees through the wintertime that were planted in the ground. Um, so that's one big piece of this is really getting them through the winter time and just my cut and cover method really quickly what i do and it's again it's not very cold necessarily here but i cut them back to six to 12 inches throw on some straw which is very insulative and then i cover that with a tarp and i weigh down the tarp with rocks and sandbags and big big um, pavers and things like that and that'll get them through my zone seven winter okay even as you said, so the next part of this is actually getting them established or getting them an early head start of the season underneath plastic, underneath a low tunnel. And this is really where the money's at. You know, it's nice to get your fig tree through the wintertime, but it doesn't mean it's a guarantee that it's going to fruit or even be very productive. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have 180 frost-free days. I have roughly six months of frost-free days. Most figs take about 180 days. So so any little edge we can give our fig tree is going to go a long way. And uh, a lot of this usually revolves around heat. It, it really does make a huge difference in the soil. And it's not necessarily heat, let's say, in the air. But the, the soil temperatures are really what are dictating the metabolism of the fig tree. So really what we're aiming for, it's around 78.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And, you know, 80 is great. 85 is great. Usually if you go over 95 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you actually enter something where it's too warm and the trees don't really grow. And I've actually experienced that here in Philadelphia, believe it or not. Hmm. If you go actually from, you know, 80 down to 70, you're still looking pretty good. But if you go from 70 to 60 or even down to 50, things don't necessarily happen. So it's kind of like you're always supposed to wait to plant your tomatoes or plant your cucumbers or plant your beans or corn because they need those warmer soil temperatures. So if you live in an area, Stephen, like, like the both of us, where you just don't really get warm soil temperatures until, let's say, June, then... At that point of the year, you've already lost a certain number of frost-free days, haven't you? Yeah. 
And one of the best ways to actually extend the season early on is with plastic, right? Is with the greenhouse. I don't think really many people know how incredible the fig is. It's one of the very few perennial fruiting trees or plants or even shrubs, vines that you could grow in a temperate climate like ours that you could cut back almost to nothing, have it re-sprout from the base, and it will still fruit. It's such an amazing plant. I think people don't recognize that, don't understand how amazing just that little simple fact is. So if we even cut our fig tree to nothing, cover it with a blanket or cover it with some insulation, and then throw a load tunnel over top of that, we're going to extend the season earlier in the year and get our fig tree the right metabolic rate at an earlier date to then give us more frost-free days, essentially. Give us a longer season. And, you know, by doing this uh, for, let's say, for me at least, I set them up. I In the most ideal scenario, I think it would be March 1st here in my, my location. Maybe for you, Stephen, it could be March 15th. Yeah. And then let's say about two weeks or three weeks later after having these low tunnels set up, hope cross your fingers you get enough sunny days, right? Because you need that sun to warm up those tunnels. But if you get enough sunny days, maybe three weeks later, your trees will wake up. And that's kind of where mine are at right now. Right around April April 1st, they did wake up. They're just now starting to bud out. And then from that point, you really only have about 90 days before you'll actually see ripe fruits. This can fluctuate rather drastically, unfortunately depending on where you live. So if you are in the Pacific Northwest, which is really quite cloudy and unfortunately doesn't get a whole ton of heat, you know, Philadelphia is very different in that, yeah, it's cold here in the winter, but it does warm up rather quickly. And we get temperatures that resemble something like summer, or at least what most people's idea of summer would be. But for people in the Pacific Northwest, or let's say the United Kingdom, it just is not warm enough. You don't get enough sunlight. But for me, you're looking at 90 days total to see ripe fruits from basically today. You know, essentially that would put my right main crop by using these low tunnels somewhere around July 1st. But if we really want to be conservative, let's say July 15th, I'll take July 15th any day of the week for my in-ground trees to mm-hmm. ripen main crop. I mean, that's that's amazing. That's even earlier than parts of California or even most of California. That's exciting. So you're getting a month, probably about a month earlier. And then for listeners who are trying to piece this together, just going back in the fall, you're cutting them back low to the ground, covering them to insulate them. And then you're just jump-starting them in the spring using these low tunnels, these very low-to-the-ground temporary greenhouses. And you're getting probably exactly. a month. Yeah, and I think it's actually more than... It, would, it could be more than a month, depending on exactly where we fall. It could be, let's say, uh, six weeks. But a month, uh-huh. I would say, is a good estimate, yeah. So that leads to, to one other question, too. For, for people who are now excited about going out and trying this... Are there a yeah. couple well-known varieties that seem like they might be really conducive to using this kind of technique? Well, I would say anything that's early, an early variety, is going to be a variety that you're going to want because you're already trying to get figs to ripen early. If you can get them even earlier, why not, right? Mm-hmm. So I would say anything that's... Uh, you know, in that 70-day mark after you actually visibly see the fruits, those are the varieties that you could say are Pastelier, Celeste, Hardy Chicago, Campaneri. There's a number of these varieties now that are floating around circulation. Uh, Yellow niches. There's actually so, so many of them. Uh, Iranian candy. People have really come together and... uh, I've found some really interesting genetics that uh, can really do well in climates like ours. Okay, that's awesome. I'm I'm excited. I'm planning to try this in my zone five. 
Now, for our listeners who want to see this on camera, tell them how they can find you on YouTube, Ross. Yeah, you just go to youtube.com slash Ross Ratty. It's R-O-S-S-R-A, D as in David, D as in David, I. And you can find my basically low tunnel adventures. I've really uh, tried to uh, put everything together in a nice playlist. And mm-hmm. actually, if uh, people go to my Instagram, you'll find a playlist there. It's the same thing as my YouTube channel, Instagram dot com slash Ross Ratty. You'll find my playlist there in my bio, which talks about all the low tunnel uh, information that we've put out so far over the last year. Fantastic. Ross, thanks for hanging out with us today. This is really exciting. Yeah, I'm I'm super excited. I hope a lot of people do this because, and also share the, the, you know, the, the progress that they're making because this is uh, a, a game changer, you know? That was my chat with Ross Raddy in Philadelphia. You can find him online at figboss.com and on YouTube and Instagram as Ross Raddy, R-A-D-D-I. And don't forget, my new book about growing figs is out, Growing Figs in Cold Climates, 150 of Your Questions Answered. And it's for sale on my website, foodgardenlife.com. Well, we're going to head into the tomato segment now, and we have a little bit of extra time. So if you have any questions about growing tomatoes, send them in quickly, and we'll see what we can do to answer them. But in the meantime, let me ask Emma, uh, for tomato varieties, you had a few listed down. Yeah, well, before we get started, our guest, Bevan Cohen, um, his website is smallhousefarm.com, and I was just looking, and he actually has a tomato lover's package of seeds on its website and an ultimate tomato lovers package. So if you're into growing tomatoes, check those out as well as a whole bunch of other seeds as well. And now let's jump into some of the different varieties. Yeah. So Emma, you have some favorites and I know Pantana Romanesco is always on your list. So Pantano Romanesco, these are some seeds that were sent to me by a friend a few years ago, and it's a medium to large size beefsteak, flattened, um, little bit of ribs, slight, and the flavor in this tomato is amazing. It's sweet and rich and it's just so flavorful. It's one of my favorite tomatoes because of that. Now back to the appearance for a second. It is a pretty usual looking red tomato. I don't grow a lot of those. I tend to love the more unusual looking ones, but I grow this one be just because the flavor is so fantastic. So if you want a really nice beefsteak tomato that has fantastic flavor, this one is definitely worth checking out. Okay. And one that you've talked about before that I love is Sunrise Bumblebee. Sunrise Bumblebee is one of my all-time favorite tomatoes. It is so good. It's a larger size cherry tomato. It's yellow with reddy orange stripes on it. Um, has a really nice tropical, fruity, sweet flavor. And it also has a thicker skin, which um, I love because it means that the tomatoes don't crack. And I can also store them for quite a while without them going bad. So that's another one of my favorite tomatoes. Now, last week, you were telling somebody about Paul Robeson as you were seeding it. Yeah, Paul Robeson is another one of my favorites because of flavor. And so it's a large, kind of purpley, brown-colored beefsteak tomato. And a lot of people describe the flavor of this tomato as sweet and smoky. And it really does taste amazing. So if you want one that tastes great, definitely one to go for. Yeah. Now, so going for something else that that looks a little bit outside what people are used to, Green Giant. Yeah, so this is one that checks the boxes with both looking unusual, which is really what I love, and also tasting great, which I also love. And so this is a large beefsteak tomato, and when it's ripe, it actually is green. So it'll become soft and sweet and flavorful like a tomato that ripens to red, except it becomes fully ripe and it becomes like that and the color stays green. So you can tell it's ripe actually because of the feel of the tomato. And you give it a soft squeeze that has a little bit of give to it and that's how you can tell that it's ripe. But it looks pretty cool because of that and the squirrels don't bother them because they can't tell that they're ripe and it tastes great as well. Okay. Well, we're getting towards the end of the show. Just a reminder that my online course, Edible Garden Makeover, will be out soon. And I'd be honored if you want to know more about it. You can find out more by jumping on my early bird list, edibleGardenMakeover.com slash early hyphen bird. 
Now, next week on the podcast, we're heading to Ohio to learn about potager gardens, gardens taking cues from from traditional French kitchen gardens um, with flowers, veg, and herbs. And our guest is potager expert and landscape landscape expert um, Jennifer Bartley from AmericanPotager.com. Now, the Food Garden Life show is just about over for today. A huge thanks to Bevan Cohen and Ross Ratty for joining us on the show today. And, of course, a huge shout-out to our producer, Gary, who makes the first Wednesday of the month so much fun. So thanks, Gary, for working your magic. Thank you. Thank you to you two. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And thanks also to all of our listeners who've uh, messaged us today. Mike, Steve, Walter, Justin, Florence, Beth, Larry, Mason, Bob, Carl, Rita, James, and Katie. Beyond outside of showtimes, connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, where we hang out as at Food Garden Life. And you can find Emma on Instagram as Emma Biggs underscore grows. And we'd love your feedback. Are, you, are we getting things right? Do you have thoughts for future shows? Send them to us, foodgardenlife.com. Yeah, we re- we really appreciate everyone who send us emails today. We love connecting with you guys. And also, if you have any ideas on people that you want to hear on the radio show or on the podcast, please let us know. We're always looking for people who are doing really neat things. And we have want to have a large diversity of guests as well. And if you could go and listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or Google Play, or any other syndicate syndicating service if you like what we do if you could rate and review us i'd really appreciate it you're listening to the food garden life show i'm stephen biggs and i'm emma biggs thanks for tuning in have a great month everyone Thank you for listening to the Food Garden Life Show with your hosts, Stephen and Emma Biggs, right here on Reality Radio 101.